When you're at the level of the Cybermen, Mr. Beast, you need a CEO, which is kind of what we are. An alcohol brand, a trading cards, a membership club, and a podcast. And did those work immediately? It worked, but there were problems. There's tens of millions of people watching. Cameras everywhere. This is the biggest opportunity in the world. I would struggle as one of the Cybermen watching KSI. When real money is made, that's when emotions change. How do you explain that? I'm naturally kind of skeptical. What have you learned about dealing with controversy? We've seen hundreds of comments over the years asking us to cover the Sidemen. From selling out arenas to opening their own retail stores, their own restaurants, a membership platform, even an alcohol brand, they really are one of the most compelling and impressive brands in our space. Powering all these businesses is their YouTube channel with nearly 20 million subscribers and their marquee series, Sidemen Sunday, that gets millions and millions of views every week. But not many people know the ins and outs of their operation. And definitely no one knows it better than Jordan Schwarzenberger. His company, Arcade Media, has been managing the Sidemen since 2021. And since then, the Sidemen have seen explosive growth. In this episode, we dive deep into the ins and outs of the Sidemen's business. And we also hear Jordan's perspective on how the creator landscape has changed and how creators can adapt to stay ahead. This episode is sponsored by Upwork. Upwork is the world's marketplace connecting businesses with independent talent from across the globe. So we used Upwork to hire a team to help us design and edit our newsletter. And now we're using Upwork to find AI experts to help push our creativity into the future. AI is changing the way that creators and businesses work. Colin and I use AI to help us brainstorm YouTube titles, thumbnail mockups, create websites, and quickly cut clips from our podcast. Adding AI to your creative process feels like you just brought on a new collaborator. Upwork is a great place to find AI experts, and it's super easy to use. If you go to upwork.com slash AI, you can find talent from all over the world. And if you don't know exactly what you want to put in your job posting, you can just type a short description and Upwork's new AI powered job generator will create the job description in seconds. Upwork allows us to build our team and hire talented people from all over the world for every part of the creative process, from thumbnail design to video editing, audio mixing, and even animations like this one. Upwork is a great place to hire. So click the link in our description, go to upwork.com slash AI, sign up for free and power your business smarter. All right, now for our episode with Jordan Schwarzenberger, the manager of the Sidemen. Dude, thank you for coming on the show. Um, We're incredibly excited to have this conversation. We've been watching from afar um, and seeing just this world being built out in the UK largely led by the Sidemen, and then finding out that you've been involved in this space for, I mean, since when? I mean, yeah. So with the Sidemen, it's been the last sort of two years. So myself, uh, my two co-founders, Aaron and Sam, basically came together. Sam had been their accountant for the last eight years, both individually and also as the group. So he'd seen this incredible rise. I mean, you say the word Sidemen to anybody in the UK, they know who they are. I always say to people that like the Sidemen are the biggest celebrities in this country for anyone under the under the age of 30. Like they know who the Sidemen are. They have grown up with them. So for all of us, we all were, were around it. I grew up with it. I'm 26. Um, but Sam had been working with them for seven, eight years. We came together as a three because we saw that there was a huge opportunity for the boys to do more. And at that time, What's the pitch for your expertise? Like, what's your relationship like with the Sidemen and what do you bring to the table? Yeah, so it was interesting. So myself, Aaron and Sam, so we're all very different, but we all kind of come together as a little unit and that became Arcade Media. Aaron was an accountant. He's an accountant by trade. Sam is an accountant. That's his background. And then I'm very much on the creative and strategy side. So I'd previously worked at a company called YMU. Before then, I'd been at um, Lab by Born at Vice, uh, basically fresh out of school and into Vice, then Lab, then YMU. And YMU became the biggest talent management company in Europe, looking after all sorts of TV presenters, social creators, sports stars, whatever it might be across all verticals, really. So I knew the roadmap. How do you exploit IP and turn it into something bigger than yourself? That was always my thing. So yeah, the conversation was, guys, like you need people who can focus on this for you you are exceptional content executors you have a bond and a community like no other no one else has fans running down the street in any part of the world like the side men do and that's because of what they built organically as seven friends but what they didn't have was the resource and the the kind of the operational expertise to come in and say right we're going to actually build this for you you focus on what you're best at we'll do the rest and that's what we what we did i have so many questions (laughs) for you based on that and which is great because it's the beginning of the show um but the first question is like you, you said you just said you're 26 years old. How old were you when you started at YMU? I was t- 
20. Where are the sidemen during this time? How aware are you of the sidemen? Yeah. And when do they come into the picture for you? The first time I ever met the guys actually, randomly, was in 2017 when they had their, cha- no, 2016 when they had the charity match at Southampton. So I just started at Lab Bible and they had the charity match that year. They'd sold out half of Southampton Stadium, 13,000 seats in like 10 seconds or something silly. And I got the opportunity to go down and cover it randomly as a, as a journalist, essentially, for Sport Bible. So I went down to the stadium in Southampton um, and I was with all the guys, you know, in the hospitality area and interviewed all the guys. I still got the videos of like me and like Vic and Josh and everyone looks so young. And I'm there with my high top. I had this huge like, head <laughs> of hair. And I remember going out on the pitch, like covering it, right? And just looking around, just seeing this wall of 13,000 and just being like, what is going on? Like, this is another league. Every time somebody walked out on the pitch, huge screams. Like, you would never believe. Like, more than music artists get, right? Like, real kind of, this connection is just on a different tier. And that's ultimately what YouTube can do. But then at the end of the end of the game, what happened was, and the, obviously the guys will remember this, I'm sure anyone who watched it will remember, but we had, like, a pitch invasion from a lot of those fans. So they all ran on the pitch at the end of the game. And you've never seen anything like it. It was like The Walking Dead. Like it was <laughs> terrifying, but everyone's tiny and they're running around. And you've got parents who yeah. are just as rabid trying to get, oh, can you sign a picture for my kid or whatever else? And these security guards are like blocking off the tunnel like that. And you just hear this like banging on the edge of the side of the wall. These kids trying to get in. Everyone's just like, what has happened? And then we ended up going back to the hotel. But to get back to the hotel, we need to get on the bus. And again, I'll remember this distinctly because there were so many people rabidly trying to chase anybody they could. Um, they had to basically like get the bus and escort it out. And then as it was driving down, I remember these kids chasing after the bus all the way down, down Southampton Pier to follow the guys to the hotel, sprinting past the bus. So we come at the stadium, there's like 20, 30 kids that they were running down the bus and everyone was just like, this is again, different. And I think that feeling stuck with me so hard that feeling of this is of a this is different this is not a normal level of connection between uh, ultimately an, an, an artist a talent a personality a creator and a fan this is of a different league and that stuck with me and then obviously it all came back around when we ended up working with the guys and you realize it's way it's way deeper than even that wow that's that's a really impactful experience to have like when you feel that for the first time like creator mm. connection like that for the first time it is really dramatic. I, I really do think that that it's like one of the most unique things. I think for us, we've experienced it with the the Dream SMP guys. Like it typically happens mm-hmm. in the gaming community. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think, and obviously streaming, right? Yeah, streaming, streaming the time gaming. you spend with these people. Yeah, yeah. it was like the charity match. We had um, obviously Speed was there last year. We had George not found. We had uh, Carl and obviously Mr. Beast mm-hmm. and his crew. But some of the some of the streamers and oh, the gaming crazy. guys, yeah. like the microphone, yeah. like. Pff, I think Crazy. the charity match is one of the most unique events in all of the creator world because it is, it is this opportunity once a year, basically, to see what happens if we get as many of our fans as possible in one place, mm. if one creator group can get as many fans as possible. And I'm sure at that time, 13,000 seemed crazy. Last 13,000 is still crazy. It is yeah. crazy. <laughs> it's still crazy. But I will never forget like watching last year's mm. charity match on YouTube and just feeling like, this. what is this, like FIFA? Yeah. Like, yeah. like, I'm, it feels like I'm watching a video game. It also, was crazy. Why mm-hmm. are they so talented? And oh yeah, because like it yeah. was fun to watch. Like it was competitive and fun, <clears> and <throat> the goals were crazy. And it was like, and, yeah. and if you watch some of the highlights, which we'll play right now while I'm talking, if you're watching on YouTube, there's like a wall of fans that is massive behind the goal. Mm. Like it is unlike anything you, you've really seen in like the entertainment world. And normally yeah. creators, because we're so digital, we don't get the opportunity to have our fans come to a physical venue that is used to handling that many people. Yeah. Like, I didn't know so what was going yeah, on. Yeah. I didn't know what was going on for that long. I didn't realize that the charity match, but when I was looking back at some of the Sidemen stuff, I realized the Sidemen <laughs> channel, the first upload on the channel is them yeah, yeah. saying, we started this channel so that we can stream the charity match. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that would have been 2016. They had, yeah. I think they've had, last year's was the fourth charity match. They had 2016, 17, 18, and then maybe there was one missed year and then COVID and then this was the return. That was also part of the... Got it. I appeal. mean, people yeah. have been cooped in for two years. They come out to the people that they have been investing a lot of their time in and connecting with for their whole lives. And I think the best thing about the charity match for me is it is a shared experience at such a scale um, between everyone who is aligned in their love for the space and the scene 
And I think that shared love, that shared sense of positivity comes through in the stadium. And you're there, you're just like, look, everyone's having the best time. Um, and whether they're, you know, kids who are there or whether they're adults who have grown up with this this space, as there are, there's a whole range. Again, this is why I think about the Sidemen as, as being so unique. Who else, who else has fans, some of whom are 12, who have just started watching them and others who are 30, who've grown up and are now married with their own kids. I saw a picture the other day of a dad with his kid at, uh, we'll talk about it, at Blue Water at the Sidemen Clothing Store. And he had a side. He, he was clearly a big fan. His kid was clearly a big fan. Whoa. And it's like passed down generation. Generational fans. And again, it that's where you get to a different level. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, it's um the charity match really brings that all together. How do you explain that that a thirteen year old and a thirty year old <laughs> would be fans of the same group? Because I feel like I'm naturally kind of skeptical. Yeah. When I hear that, I'm curious. What is, in your opinion, that like special element or the special sauce that makes that many people? at that age range, mm. interested in them to, like, to this degree. Yeah, well, I think it's a combination of things. One is the platforms are where 13-year-olds are watching and consuming their content, right? They're on TikTok, they're on YouTube. They, they, That's where they channel most of their time or a lot of their time. And then for the Cybermen being now 28 to 26 to 30, people have grown up with them. So if you're 30 now, you know, these guys, you've grown up in the same journey as these boys. You were at school at the same time that they were at. You've, you know, you've lived your life as they've grown in parallel. And I think that's the key with the Cybermen that's different. It's the friendship that they have. It's entirely organic. It's not like they're trying to make content in a certain way. They are just being themselves as a group of friends doing funny and incredible things together. And that's the thread that is so universal. It means you can watch it at 13, you can watch it at 30, and you get the same sense of, of love and you know joy from watching that content, which a lot of people have. I think one of the most interesting things is to look back at like the Sidemen's origins are in gaming. Yeah. Which I think from the broader entertainment landscape was really confusing to latch onto, right? Why are people watching other people play video games? <laughs> yeah. That was like yeah. everyone's question. <laughs> I lined up like every mom in like 2016. Yeah, I like, don't why are you watching it. someone else play games? Why are you <laughs> yeah. watching? I mean, even for me, yeah. I was confused. By it's it. a good like, question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, why? And then, but yeah. then you start to realize like you're spending long periods of time. There's a sense of humor to it. Mm. There's a sense of culture. They're joking around with each other. Um, I'm curious, like as creators, you look, you're looking for people you can trust. Yeah. You know, the guy from sport Bible, who's coming to film us at the charity match. Mm. How do you go from that guy to mm. how many years between that guy? And now I'm running the business side of the side. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I think the best thing and the thing that I'll always credit why I'm you for giving me was the opportunity at 1920 to get like the best business education I could ever get to be in the room with some incredible elite talent, like to be able to be pushed to that degree meant that. Thankfully, I was able to skill myself up very quickly to the point where I had a good, decent, good understanding of the challenges that most of these people felt. Because it's pretty similar challenges. It's how do you scale? How do you, you know, be creative? How do you come up with new, you know, new IP and new ways of of, of adding value to your audience? And so for the side, it kind of writes itself. It's like, guys, you have this great connection as seven friends with your audience. Here's a whole world around you that can be done. If we get the creative right, right, if we make it fun, if we make it value adding. So I think that was the thing. It was like building up enough strategic, I guess, practice to be able to go to them with Sam and Aaron as a three and sit there and say, look, like Sam is exceptional at money and finance and accounting. Aaron, exceptional commercial. I'm hopefully decent at creative and strategy. We come together as a three. It's a very, I think it's a, it's a hard proposition to say no to when you haven't got anybody there. Um, and also our bit, our willingness to say, we're going to be all in with you. And that's, we can get into that, but that's the big distinction between what we do is we say we're exclusively with them. Like we are fully in, we're basically a family office for the side men. We're not trying to- Oh, you don't out. represent <clears throat> other creators? Mm. No. Oh, interesting. So is there a moment here where there's an actual meeting with all seven guys, the three of you? <laughs> on like, Zoom. Because it, like, it was COVID, right? I, like the funny thing is I never met Sam my business partner until we started the business. No way. Uh, probably like six months after meeting him on Zoom because everything was done remotely and he lives out in, in um, Worthing in near Brighton. So yeah, it was all of us on Zoom. Um, and I remember when we ran through a deck, presented the strategy, said, guys, this is our, this is the vision. Um, what do you think? Do you want to go for it? And they said, yeah. What were some of the elements of the vision? So we had, I think about 15 Again, because I've done so many of these, right? I knew how to like a pump a strategy deck out in like okay. no time now because we've done it so many times. I think there were like 15 different elements around their brand. So how do you expand into new territories? You know, do you look at a food brand? Do you look at an alcohol brand? Do you look at, you know, literary and books? Do you look at live touring? Like oh, these are all the different elements, like an agency would, I mean, you know. And so I was able to sit there and say, look, here's the web around your brand and here's how we could do it tangibly to add value to what you're doing right now. Um, 
and then what we did after that is there were like 15 ideas. The guys then voted on them as this was the first insight into their process, which is old, honestly like the secret sauce to how they do it is their mm. process, their ability to be democratic. The Supreme Court of the Sidemen, I always say, it's like a 4-3 four, <laughs> <a> four, <three> majority <clears throat> every time, right? Wow. So if the majority wins, I gotta write that rarely, down. rarely is there a 4-3. Generally, they're all in on something, <clears throat> but the majority always wins. So we Can saw you that. imagine the politics you know what? That Look, like, I mean, Court. well, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think, <laughs> thankfully, because they've done it so much, yeah. you know, they're like, yeah, we know what everyone's going to think about each decision, mm. but they can very quickly go, <clears throat> yep, no, no, yep, cool. If it's a majority, it gets through. So anyway, so we had that with these ideas, and we have a spreadsheet which I still have, right, with all of the ideas that we laid out in a table, and then alongside they had each of their names, and then it was a formulated spreadsheet so that when they put in a number out of 100 it would like pump out basically out of 10 sorry it would pump out a score and at the end it would show the score grade Whoa. it in terms of light green to red and if it got in the top green I think it was 60 points was a majority we'd do it if it was under 60 we wouldn't do it so I think about 4 or 5 ideas got into the top those ideas being sides which at the time was just the name um, because it was a funny name uh, an alcohol brand not knowing what it would be uh, trading cards got in there uh, a membership club and a podcast, I think, with a first spread. Wow. And so then once you have that mandate, and this was, again, us like applying the best of my experience of YME, which is, you know, once you get that strategy right, once you have that mandate, you're kind of away. And the strategy shouldn't really change. It was always my belief. It's like, if you get that strategy correct from day one, it shouldn't really change. Maybe you have some variations, but in reality, if you have your North Star, you know where you're getting to. It's always where we start those decks off. Like, what's the objective? What's the mission? What are your values? Like, how do you approach like bring some of that thinking in and then the ideas really should be you know should be that should be your next few years not was, was there an element though of convincing them to choose you guys or was it just here's the first meeting here's the strategy yeah and then immediately they voted on things that they would want yeah like did do. they have representation before yeah who well, was they, doing yeah. their business so so the space in the uk is a bit a bit interesting so for those who don't know it's a, i doubt anyone would necessarily unless you're in it you don't have the manager agent dynamic that you have in the states in the states legally as you, as you guys know you know in la you cannot be a manager and an agent at the same time managers can't sell agents can't manage there's a clear distinction in the uk we don't have that legislation so because we're quite far behind managers typically are agents agents typically are managers so the focus is always around transactional brand deals that's basically the focus because there aren't really many other areas to make money if you're not at the scale where you can leverage ip then what's the upside in terms of building brands? Rarely is that an option for most creators. If you're making money from brand deals, then yeah, that's your first step. So managers basically commission brand deals. That's kind of all they do. Typically, that's maybe unfair to say it's a big generalization, but generally speaking here, they, they do brand deals. That's the main focus. The big gap really was on strategy and on building long-term. And I think the reality is there aren't many like the side men who weren't that sort of thinking, which is why when we went to them and said, look, this is the approach, they were like, yeah, this makes sense for us because they could see the vision wrote itself, but also that they're at a scale and a point in their career where they're like, right, we want more time. We want more freedom to make content. We are, you know, we want to build, but how do we build whilst also keeping what we do at the core of, of what we're doing rather than try and do everything all at once, which made it a relatively easy conversation where it wasn't even a sell so much. It was more a partnership almost offer to say, guys, look, we will build this for you if you give us a shot. And look, I will forever be indebted. I think all of us will for them giving us that shot. We still were completely new. Sam had built up this incredible relationship with them for so long. They didn't know me. They didn't know Aaron. We never met, but they, I guess, trusted the instinct and the vision and also the focus, I think, to say we're all in on this. And once we got to that point where they were like, yeah, then it was a no-brainer. to kind Sam of was their accountant? That. Yeah, so that's the X factor, right? Because like we always talk about who creators listen to, mm. right? Even even for us, we were as we started catching some traction, we're pitched all kinds of things, mm. right? You, you as a creator, the second you get traction, you're getting calls. Hey, yeah, I got mm -hmm. an idea for you yeah. guys. Let me pitch you something. Hey, mm -hmm. with my strategy and your distribution we can do this, mm -hmm. you know? And it's <laughs> yeah. like- But a lot of people have strategy. A yeah, lot of yeah, people yeah. have strategy, right? But, uh, you know, people who we listen to are like, our accountants are pretty- Lawyers. Accountants, lawyers, yeah. other creators. Yeah. Sam Sam is the only reason why me and Aaron would have been in the conversation. For sure. Yeah, that and makes sense. Sam, and that's, and that's because accountants don't change. Like once you have an accountant and yeah. you're happy, you trust them with the most sensitive thing that you have, which is your money. Yeah. So once that trust is built, and so that's always what Sam said. He said, look, I've been looking at these. I know how much more they can do yeah. <laughs> with the right people. Right. You guys are the right people. 
And then from there, the trust was built. They warmed to us, I think, because we came with a approach that was long term. It wasn't about money in the short term. It was like, no, we will build these things. How were you um, incentivized or compensated? Like, yeah. what, what was the pitch of how you're going to make money? Commission based off of the success of what was to be built. So explain that further. Like, if you're so for pitching those, to me. Yeah. So, so imagine we, so the idea is, and this is another thing in the UK, right? AdSense is not really on the table for managers. Neither should it be. I'm a big yeah. believer that you shouldn't commission we AdSense. Don't, we don't, yeah. com no one commissions our AdSense. And a lot of people do commission AdSense or try to, and it never works. So firstly, AdSense is never going to be an option because you're not adding value to it, right? Simon Clothing already building, growing. We're not adding value to it. So for us, it was a case of, look, we're all, I was coming from, you know, like a well-paid job. Aaron was coming from an independent business that he'd set up to manage some TikTok creators at the time. Um, and then Sam was part-timing alongside his accountancy work because he wanted to keep that naturally. So when we came together, it was a case of, right, we will pay for ourselves until we generate revenue for you. Oh, wow. And mm. we will only commission what we add value to and what we build with you because we want to build this for the long term. But also we knew like, this is the biggest opportunity in the world, really, I think, in this space at that time, or one of the biggest. And for us to be able to do it, it was very low risk in our end because we knew, because we'd done the planning, we knew this would work. That's a really attractive proposition. From pitch. a creator perspective, to have a partner come to you and say, look, we, won't, we don't need the money right now. Mm. We will wait until we actually prove to you that we can make money for you. Yeah, That's the most attractive. Like, <laughs> That's the, as yeah. creators, that means that you actually see our value mm. and you believe in yourself yeah. and your own ability yeah. you're willing to bet on your own ability mm. so you're saying mm. commission or equity in these projects because i yeah. would assume like as you're looking at hey we're going to build a restaurant brand yeah, or, yeah. like the long term for you is yeah having combined. Some ownership it's state. combined it's and combined. then that's again okay. the the mindset for us is a long term it has to be because yes you can get uh, if we were chasing short-term cash we would do what every other agent and brand, brand deal merchant 100%. does. They have their place. There's some incredible brand deal managers and agents really in the UK. Stuart Jones, for example, runs Upload Agency. Phenomenal business. We work with them very closely. They are like the kings at brand deals for creators. That's what they do in the UK. They're great. What they aren't building is a scaled management business to house loads of creators, right? Because that's not, they can't do both. And that's the bit. You're world-class at brand deals. That's what you do. Where were they as a, brand and as a business mm. in this moment like how big were they how big was jj individually yeah and was merchandise the largest revenue driver yeah so they were at i want to say eight million sub no eight or nine million subs just before 10 i want to say or maybe just at 10 and then now they're at 18 and a half or something so it's like <laughs> nearly doubled in two years um so yeah incredible growth at that time you just come off the back of you know pre-covid jj logan 2 which was obviously massive um and that whole influencer boxing moment that obviously now has now come back around but you had that b b before covid yeah the other guys building like huge audiences independently people like ethan who just had his incredible i don't know if you know his story but an unbelievable story of sort of transformation in terms of his weight in terms of his mental health incredible journey that had trans you know that had kind of come out through a youtube documentary that really raised his profile so he that all of them have been doing things individually and at the time we came together it was you know you guys are really in a flow they had tanya who is like the, the most always will forever say that from the outside looking in if they didn't know she is the number one person in the operation for those who don't know her i want to i want to get to her because Fine, we, she's on the list yeah, yeah she's yeah. on the list because we've had some calls with her and I can feel from just talking to her that she's an, she's one of the biggest unlocks yeah. for the Sidemen. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. She Without her, there is no Sidemen operation. That's crazy. Mm, and yeah. I, I want to get into that because like hiring the right team is, is crucial. She was their first hire, which yeah. you know, we can get yeah. into. Mm. Um, so yeah, they're in a, an incredible place. I mean, we were, I always say like we didn't bring anything to any of that side of things. I always say like looking back at management and how we'd sometimes pitch to, to creators and this is where the AdSense conversation sometimes comes up where, you, where managers sometimes go, look, we're building your profile everywhere we're helping you to grow and scale therefore we deserve your adsense like a i don't think that's true right the creator is driving the adsense but also for us example for instance with the boys at the point we started work with them they are the biggest celebrities in the country for anyone under 30 they've been building a huge content operation independently with people like con and john and james doing an amazing job we came in to help them go from already up here 
to that next level. That was our job to unlock that next door for them that they couldn't do on their own because they don't have the time, resources, expertise. That was our role. And that is our role still today. Rather than saying we added value to anything they built all yeah. that time. That's not what we did. Business builders. Exactly. Yeah. How realistic do you think it is for a manager to manage multiple creators at once? Because it's interesting that you guys went all in with the yeah. sidemen. Yeah. I think it is, it comes with a complete set of challenges that are you know, you can work around them and it can work. It works for most, right? Most people, most management, I mean, is there any other management company in the world at this level who has one client? Probably not. They have scale businesses. Look at Knight, look at, you know, One Day End with, with Zach and so on. And they have great businesses that work and that's their model. I think if you go in with that, it's one thing. If you start a management company with the intention of scaling, the challenge for me is actually like, okay, so we work with the side men for a period of time and then we go and start working with other creators and we start building out our roster and we end up with 10 clients 20 clients and really we're using the side men as leverage to build that it's roster marketing, yeah and that becomes incredibly distasteful a but also we lose focus on them and the key the only reason why we're having that conversation in the first place why we have any value whatsoever is because our focus is on them it's i not think there's an out. emotional component as the creator mm. when you're working with someone and then they aren't all in on you and build a roster where you're like yeah, and you always okay, get how so, much time are they spending? Like, oh, they're a bit distracted. Oh, you see on yeah, Instagram, well, they're out there with this car, this creator yeah. and this person. Am I replaceable? Am mm. I? Do I matter to mm. to this operation? Do you actually believe in me? Yeah, or are you or, hedging your bets? Or are you hedging yeah. your bets? And, and why are you, are you hedging, hedging your bets? And they are yeah. hedging their bets. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's kind of confusing too. And I think mm. sometimes you forget that emotional component of like we're creative yeah. people yeah and we want people who believe in us yeah. around us 100%. and we're willing to, it, like the quickest way to develop resentment like creators develop resentment towards their management all the time i would say mm -hmm. more often than not mm. because they're sitting there and they're like why are they collecting 15 percent of this i haven't what heard, are they bringing i haven't heard mm -hmm. from them in months mm. right or weeks or like you know do they really provide this amount of value especially yeah, when the yeah. deals get to the millions mm. 15 percent turns into Hundred fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. I always think also yeah. when when real money is made. Yeah, that's when emotions change. That's because when you go. Hang change. on a minute. What have you been doing? Or yeah. why have you been spending all this time? You know, working with. And there was one of the big learnings from YME. We had too many clients. We had mm. a thousand clients in that business. So do you think as creators, when they're looking for mm. management or for business help, because creators and creatives need strategy yeah, business. Yeah. They even need people to re reply to the brand deal emails. Like yeah. that is a real yeah. thing that you need. How do mm. they? approach because like the side men are unique like you can go all in with the side men and build more than a career off mm, of that mm. but this, you know up-and-coming creators how do they look at management yeah. i think when you're at the level of the side men mr beast you have some you know a, a mm. real category where actually you need coordination for everything you need a ceo which is kind of what we are we're like three ceos of the external side ceo yeah yeah then great but actually for most creators they need support on a case-by-case -case basis project per project without going all in because i think most people on the management side can't justify going all in with most creators because they're not at the scale that warrants it they can't make whereas, an income doing right it. Yeah. whereas if you say actually you know, we've got, we, we do 10 projects, 20 projects with all different types of creators, all non-exclusively. We don't manage anybody, but we're building, you know, we're building a fashion brand for you. We're building a, a restaurant for you. We're building a, a membership club for you, whatever it might be. Then actually no one's going to have a problem with that as long as the businesses don't compete. So I don't know. This is my theory that I think it's going to move more into consulting. I, I agree. I'd prefer to pay a flat rate for a service. Yeah. Or even a flat rate in a smaller equity position. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they're great, rather yeah. than being like, right, you're managing me in everything. Yeah. And know? I think... Uh, also because it is that you know evolution of value and evolution of like mm. if, if we're building a media company we actually don't need the same thing that someone who's like a host or yeah. building as a comedian needs or a musician yeah which mm. is where the management and agent structure comes from exactly right and exactly. we are publishers mm. which is different so uh, back to the side men i think to put them in that position one of the most interesting things for me is the format of side men sunday yeah that to me feels like for the outside looking in mm. was an unlock mm. going from gaming content to like the house to saying, Hey, every Sunday we're going to make something. Yeah. And today, you know, when I look at Sidemen Sunday, they're pushing the limits of time, right? To the, the, the most watched episode mm. of Sidemen Sunday has over a hundred million views and is over two hours long. 
And the most recent one that just came out, it's about an hour about the farming. Yes. You know, yeah, them becoming yeah. farmers. Yeah. Looks like TV. Yeah. Feels like, you know, TV. Got drones, you have got posters. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Posters that come out that look like it's a movie that's about yeah, to launch. Yeah. It's Oscar from, from Denmark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 19 years old. He's, he's unbelievable. I mean, he's unbelievable yeah. Yeah. to create those posters. Um, and it's 4 million views overnight. Like this engine of mass distribution, mm. incredible amounts of time is from my perspective, what put them in the position to say, to vote on that list of what can we do next? Yeah. And that's why you cannot have a list unless yeah. you've got to this position where exactly. your engine and your infrastructure is a machine. We had a Lamborghini to build from. Do you know yeah, what I mean? We totally. had the best of the it best. It wasn't a broken down car. It was We're like, not fixing it. Like, yeah. this is like, you have the best car in the world to sell and to build. It's not, that's a per terrible analogy, but you get the point. You, mm -hmm. We are not working with something that is either at its infancy or or that is you know falling off that needs help like the Simon were as relevant as ever then they are more relevant than ever now and does that yeah. unlock Tanya yeah well so ta so so TP is the fans will know her as if any yeah Simon fans know her but they don't know who she really is properly some do see her in the back of a video now and then but she was their first hire and will forever be looking at their story as a, objectively the most important hire because she was the first person to come in who coordinated everything. She was, and still is, their lead, essentially like head of production for Cyber Sunday. So that was their first format as a group. She comes from a world that understands process and structure and you know coordination at a really high level. How do you bring that into the world of YouTube to give it more finesse, to give it a structure, to be managing shoots as a, as a real production? And I think that's where a number of creators are starting to move to now. The Simon were doing it back in, I think she probably was hired in 2019, I'd imagine, when they did that show, maybe 2018. Um, and her role is essentially to run the production on Cyber Sunday. So it's her, it's Lucy, who's a, an art director, set designer. She does all the amazing sets and she sort of um, seconds her. And yeah, without them, there is no Cyber Sunday because the operational running of that is really contingent on, on those two. Um, and they've been doing it still for however long. Lucy joined full time, I think about a year ago. TP was doing it on her own for a long time. <laughs> like one person doing the scale of, of their shoots, the coordination of all seven of them, managing the production of that is just unbelievable. And she's, yeah, she's the nicest person you ever meet. She is so lovely. You were spoken yeah, on the phone. She's, she's amazing. amazing. Mm -hmm. And and like so understated as well. Like she she's just so brilliant in every way. Like we have like endless respect for her and what she's been able to do independently. And even today, it's like, you know, how do we just support her even from our side of things, we're sort of, you know, obviously more on the business and the content, but how do we just support her to do her job and to bring more yeah. people and resources? I in mean, here? to get a hundred million people to watch two hours. Yeah. I mean that, that you can build so much off of that mm. and to do that consistently. Yeah. yeah. Like to, to really unlock this format that mm. every Sunday there's going to be this massive production, right? Like, yeah. and I, I, I think Vic mentioned it in the uh, Mr. Beast podcast they did but like when they collaborated with jimmy it was like a mm. half million dollar budget yeah <laughs> like those yeah. are not small budgets yeah, to yeah. handle yeah. and they have stakes and they have implications mm. and there's tens of millions of people watching mm. like she's one of the largest entertainment producers <laughs> uh, in the world right probably. <laughs> in the world yeah which is yeah. kind of crazy yeah and that team unlock i think paired is with crazy. the art director mm. like right. those two things of having Tanya as like the head of production producer and an art director. Yeah. You look at Sidemen Sunday, the trajectory mm -hmm. of the look of it, the feel mm -hmm. of it, where it's taken their brand. It's like really transcended YouTube to this other place yeah. of like, it's not fully traditional media, but it looks. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I'll be honest. more premium than a lot of traditional mm -hmm. media. And I'll, yet it's still digital. I'll be honest. I haven't watched all Sidemen Sundays, mm -hmm. but. I'm very aware when the posters drop. Oh yeah, because yeah. the posters. I'm posters I'm like a fan right. of the posters. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they look so professional, and to mm. treat our world. It was one of the first times that I was like, oh, these guys are treating our world with the same respect that Netflix treats mm. one of their drops, right? If they're if they're yeah. launching a show, and we as creators, we have to do it ourselves. No one's mm. going to do it for us. Mm. There's no mm. you know firm that's marketing our own yep. content. Mm -hmm. So if we don't treat our own work like it's the same as Hollywood, mm. then who's going to treat it like that, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big believer in making things feel really big, right? And yeah. giving moments to to any launch or any anything that you've put any time or energy into creatively deserves a level of respect in terms of the way that you market these things. And I think, you know, so often you can 
do drops of stuff and that's it and it can get caught but actually when you build a real plan around these things like we have an incredible team like the, i mean you can get into the team if you, if you guys want to talk about that but the best team on everything that we're doing now victor is the md of arcade media now he started off as the head of side plus then moved to the head of content role so looking after the whole content operation for the side men and he is one of one unbelievable came from fanatic um and he took a leap he was like left his job at fanatic to come in basically run side plus um and try and make that work within i think five or six weeks and he did an incredible job we can get into that later but he's now built this incredible team of people creatives from around the world right who are exceptional at delivering for this space in mm. a way that is of such a caliber and i think the interesting thing is most of our creators are like 19, 20 years old. Like Oscar, who makes the posters, he's 20 years old. He's from Denmark, right? He started working with Victor when he was at Fnatic. Now he's making the you know, posters, which are for the biggest- Scandinavians have really good design taste. Uh, they have That's great the taste yeah. and great talent. So a yeah. lot of our team are actually from Scandinavia because they are like the really? best. But also weirdly, they're the highest density of Sidemen fans in the world. Oh, that's so interesting. Norway interesting. is the com is the country with the highest density in the world based on our data on oh. Cyplus. Interest that's another aside. So before but we yeah. get I do want to get into team, yeah, yeah. but I want to come back now to that list. So yes. what was first on the list yeah. from the democracy of like voting? Supreme Court, yeah. Yeah, the Supreme the, Court of the side. The man. ruling. Yeah. So the first on the list I'll pull it up. I want someone to design a poster <laughs> for the Supreme Court of the South because yeah, that's yeah. such I'll, a cool ask Oscar. term. I can't show it. Only reason being it has ideas that are going to come. So, because <laughs> okay. I think some of them on there are, are in the works. But essentially we had number one and number two. One was alcohol, so XIX, and then number two was sides, interestingly. Wow, so, that so was, that, that alcohol and food were, were the top two. And did those work immediately? Yes. Like sides is a good example where it worked, but there were problems. Problems being um, that we underestimated naively, I think everybody did, how proficient Deliveroo and Uber Eats would be in the management of such volume. So, Sides is ghost kitchen. Sorry. Yeah, if yes. you could just explain sorry, yeah. the context. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, so Sides is a our ghost, well, started off as a ghost kitchen brand. Really, it was a, it's a fried chicken brand by the Sidemen. The whole concept sprang from the idea that, again, the boys wanted to do a food brand, they all love fried chicken. It's the number one food in the world for a reason. Um, and they wanted to make an amazing product and, and a brand that really worked. We were lucky enough to find partners with German Donner Kebabs top co company called Hero Brands who've been brilliant. And we made sides with them. We're actually going <laughs> to, I don't even know if anyone knows it. We were literally about to do it ourselves <laughs> in a type. We were, we were very close. I had the DocuSign for a single ghost kitchen unit in Vauxhall, which would have been the biggest disaster of all time, <laughs> knowing what we know now. And and very providentially, we had that DocuSign ready to go for the lease. And then we ended up meeting the team behind German Donner Kebab, who are hero brands. And they said, look, we're really interested in this space. Obviously, we want to do something. We've got an amazing amount of expertise. So we said, well, yeah, why would we not want to? You guys are experts in food. You know exactly what you're doing. You built GDK to the fastest growing food brand in the country. We'd be so silly to think that we could do it on our own. And now having worked with partners and done a number of these things, we look. I look back and just go, that would have been so dumb if we'd actually done that. And I'm so grateful that we didn't. And they came in just at the right time. We launched it in nine ghost kitchens, only in London. The Sidemen fan base, obviously global. Huge UK audience as well. People around the country, not everything is London. I think one thing is every, a lot of things are very London focused when the majority of people are not in London. And so you put a real pressure on these nine sites. So we have people coming down from, the, from parts of the country to stay at the train station to sit in a bench to order sides. You have people getting hotels coming from all, all parts of, the, of like the country, probably the world, to order sides the day it came out and to try it. So imagine the pressure on Deliveroo and Uber Eats. And it was similar to the conversation that you had with Reed. He said the same thing. I was like, yes, like pain. <laughs> yeah. I feel your pain, bro. <laughs> because we had no chicken in a lot of our sites. We had no drivers because it's not our drivers, it's delivery. We had people waiting four hours. I remember ordering from my flat at the time and we were waiting for, I was waiting for three hours for the order to come through. So we're just like, oh my, like probably the worst brand experience you can imagine. How, how were the guys during that time? Stressed. We were all stressed because we were just like, what is going on? Like this is, you know, we've got, we've got the kitchens, we've got the product, but, but because of the infrastructure in relation to their scale, it was just underestimated by everybody. And how do you do that on ghost kitchens, which is 
how we pivoted now and we can get into that but it was really interesting so because of that we then you know had to really work out right how do we start like nailing this customer experience so people never have that again obviously we're in control of a certain amount but we can't be in control of delivery yeah you can have bigger units you can have you know more chefs but that's also tough because reef and their operation is around sort of small ghost kitchen units in different parts of the in different parts of the country different parts of london so i'd say that the first year of sides was really ghost kitchen focused we had i think a great product that was inconsistent in its delivery across various parts of the country various parts of, of the U, of london and the uae as well where we had kitchens ghost kitchen delivered food is never that great is the learning you're never going to get it to be good it's i think from any restaurant and we found that with sides very quickly that you know the quality and the consistency and the way we could control the output was basically hindered by the model itself so we had to pivot and thankfully we launched box part wembley which changed everything for us so box part wembley was our first physical unit our first dine-in right and we did we opened that in a, in wembley box part which is like a i don't know if it'd be hard to explain to to people in the states maybe i don't it's know it's like a bunch of like wembley stadium New Wembley Stadium. It's like a sh- it's a bunch of shipping containers. It's that shi- is that are, it's a shipping container. Yeah, it's a cool place hall. to eat. Yeah, it's a food mm-hmm. court. It's a cool food place. Court, to eat. It's yep. a shipping container based food yeah. court. So we opened a unit there, and the day we launched, like literally everything changed for the brand because people had a reference point. They had a gold star. Dining food could be fresh. It's hot. It's the best it can possibly be. So people traveled from around the country. People traveled from around the world to Wembley. They still do, but they had the gold standard of no, this is what sides mm. are supposed to be. So is there only one restaurant now? No, so we have, we cut down a lot of our ghost kitchens. So if anyone actually can't get sides on um, on delivery, on delivery in Uber Eats, we've got some, but we cut down any that weren't performing well. We got, we got ruthless to the point where if something wasn't a 10 out of 10, it'd be cut. If there was a packaging mistake, it'd be cut. We were very diligent on that so that we were controlling our operators so that they weren't putting out food that wasn't great because ultimately their incentivization, what they cared about was scale, not the quality of the product, which is why we've pivoted mm. away from ghost kitchens and moved very very firmly into brick and mortar now so we've got Wembley Box Park Gravity and Wandsworth we have um, a number coming that I can't talk about just yet but we have 10 ready by the end of this year hopefully uh, if all goes to plan property is tricky but they're all going well we've got a number being fitted out now across high streets across shopping centres it's going to be really cool and the aim we've got uh, just last year I'll say we have a master franchise agreement with a company called Quiz who are taking 200 stores within the next 10 years so they've committed to that 100 stores over the next 5 oh Um, and yeah, it's wow. going to be a completely different business. And we see from Wembley, we see from Gravity, we know what this brand can do in physical. It just needs the distribution now. So obviously that that's pretty incredible to be going to that many locations. I'm curious for you, seeing that Sides and Vodka were the first ventures mm. that you launched, did you feel that there was increased pressure and extra worried even for your role and your relationship with the guys when you launched Sides mm. and it's somewhat of a disaster yeah i mean i think we the, that i remember the, that night was like stressed like we were we were all the boys us because they'd never done anything like this we never done anything like this we're obviously working with our partner who we found we believe in them we've come together as a group to try and make this work and because ultimately of the model itself and the and the huge scale of the audience it just didn't work as we wanted to we had so many fans who were right and be like oh i tried to get it but i couldn't get it etc etc and i think for us in terms of relationship it was a great and a, it was a good and a bad thing i mean all of it i think worked out brilliantly well what it definitely did do was it tested all of us. We never really had that kind of test. We'd launched Side Plus, brilliant success, had gone really well. The business was 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 great. We were able to invest in more of a team, build more shows, and that was rolling. It was good. This one was great in, in potential and what we knew it could be. But again, the model just didn't allow for it to come through as a business. So that's why we ended up pivoting. It's also unfamiliarity, right? Like yeah. content is, you're familiar. Yeah. If it's make content, sell ads or make content, yeah. sell subscriptions. You can be world class in that. Yeah. You can figure that out when you're when you're launching a restaurant. Yeah. That's yeah. like a whole new yeah, yeah. ball game. I also sure. think that's like, expen- it sounds expensive and relatively low margin, right? Yeah. Well, so again, the best thing, and this is a big piece of advice for any creator who's looking to build these things. Don't do it on your own. Yeah. <laughs> Never. Yeah. Don't capitalize them unless you have to. People will be will be willing out. The people who are experts in the things you want to do will have the capital and will be willing to invest if you have the distribution and the great concept. I think if people aren't willing to put the capital behind it, you might not have a thing. Right. <laughs> it might not mm-hmm. be the right time for you to do it. Right. right? And uh, then it's a good market test. Yeah. Actually, is this an opportunity? Yeah. So Hero 
big business, huge, you know, huge right. growth of that year. They they had cash to invest in things. And so they were willing to cash flow the business and bring it up to speed. And very grateful for them to be able to, for, for them putting their, their money where their mouth is, so to speak, and really believing in the idea and the concept for sides. And for vodka, we both do both brands with them. And oh, so they, they do the vodka brand Yeah, too. so we do the vodka brand with them as well. They have a wholesaler called United Wholesale. Um, and yeah, they, they've they been great. Like they, I you cannot fault their belief in these brands to basically invest in them and help get them up to up to speed because these things are expensive but not just expense it's the resource and the expertise you need to do them probably more so than the cost it's like you actually need to know how to get like everything done in a way that is at this level because if it's not at that level and thankfully we were able to get there in terms of product in terms of branding packaging you know all the regulations around food all the regulations around alcohol bonding when it comes to vodka all these things there's so many details that you don't know so forever grateful for them for being such good partners and actually helping us to bring these two ideas to life in a way that you know has been challenging at times but it's been incredibly fun and actually we've all learned so much and the main thing is when people get the product for both brands they love it and the feedback on the actual product itself is undeniably brilliant. And that's what the one thing where we go, okay, cool. We now just need to scale the distribution. We need sides everywhere. People, my theory is this, like personally, same with Jimmy and, and, and the Mr. Beast brand. Because people know the side men everywhere, the awareness is so high. Why would they go to Slim Chickens or Wingstop or KFC when they have a product made by their favorite creator or may or backed by their favorite creator why would they if they can see if the if the price is comparable let's say and they're in the same tier and the product is better over here and the value is better in our brand because they have an affinity and a love for the sidemen they'll go to sides that's the theory and i believe that's true because they have a warmth they build that it's that connection it's the standing in the stadium seeing that reaction how do you emulate that reaction for value adding products that are great how do you how do you emulate that reaction for the best fried chicken brand that we could possibly make or the best vodka product that we could possibly make and i think that's the key when you sort of take that connection apply it to a really great product and an amazing brand that can stand on its own two feet, I think that's when you have traction and that's what we're seeing. I'll never forget the day the box part launched and we had a queue. They had to close off the club next to our unit and we had a whole queuing system trailing around all the way outside of the building. You know, hundreds of people coming down, huge amount of hype and noise for it um, because people love the Sidemen and that's the that's the equity that they've built for the last 10 years. Yeah. which is why this is so much fun to do because we get to provide these loyal, incredible people from around the country with amazing value-adding products backed by, provided by, made by their favorite creators. If we were to go to the next charity match, mm. would we be able to eat sides at the Sidemen charity match? We're working on it. We're working on, <laughs> working it. on okay. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That so, to me is like the full, you know, in the Disney World, Disney map right. sense of yeah. we're providing the entertainment, you're also eating the food. Yeah. It's all working with the characters itself. are there. The yeah, Mickey yeah. Mouse is yeah. there, right? Like, yeah, yeah, just yeah. like they're all there. I get to eat the food. I get to drink the vodka. I get to watch the exclusive mm. BTS on Side Plus. Plus. I yeah. bought the trading cards. I get the trading cards. Yeah. yeah, it's it's a whole universe. It's like the Marvel universe that you're building exactly. out. Exactly. So Side Plus. Mm. It, it sounds like that launched before Side well, September 2021. 20, yeah. So that makes sense, right? When you zoom out, mm. okay. Uh, creators are making content. They're making AdSense, brand deals, merchandise if they're as big as the Sidemen. Yeah. And then Patreon membership, you know, basically paid subscription content. Mm. And at the scale of the Sidemen, you know, first of all, they're producing so much content. As creators, it feels overwhelming to be like, make more. Mm. Um, how did you go about launching Side Plus? And yeah. can you explain... The concept, why you didn't go with Patreon yeah. or something like that, yeah, why yeah. you built it yourself. Yeah, for sure. So again, it writes itself, right? You have world-class creators who make content that people love. How can you create a system that allows them to do more of that content commercially by making it so that it can fund itself and grow into its own entity and business, providing a huge amount of value to the fans who want more and are willing to support the Sidemen. They've been producing free content for their whole careers. Everyone does on YouTube, not free ad, obviously ad yeah, funded ad essentially. Yeah. Um, but producing content for free in terms of the fan paying, how do you create a relationship that is more of a, of a supporting system like a Patreon? How do you do that for the Sidemen? That was always the, the immediate logical step. How can we make the content that we wanted to make that would be value adding, would be great, but also protect their lives. How we did that was a podcast, first and foremost, studio environment, 
manageable you sure. can manage a studio mm-hmm. Sit down <laughs> you're not record. traveling around yeah yeah so start with a studio so we we got a studio uh in east london and we were able to kit it out with our sidecar side set and within that set the idea was to have two or three different shows from sidecar so you could interchange the set at the beginning we then had a bts so johnny who if you're on instagram you might see is johnny bts he is the cameraman who basically follows and documents and creates these beautiful BTS documentaries on Side Plus. They can be two, three hours long. They can be long. Um, and people want that. I watched length. the farm one last <laughs> night. Yeah. Uh, the strangest thing to me was to log on to Side Plus and it looks like Netflix mm. from a design perspective. Mm. There's a trending tab on Side Plus. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, so this is content that's trending mm. inside of this membership community. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, the comments, it's wild. the forum, like the community there is real. And I think people wanted, I think the, there were there was a section of the fan base that wanted to, A, they wanted more, but they wanted that connection with the community on a, on, a, on a more intimate level, I think. When you're on YouTube, right, you have a subscriber base. It's hard to really feel connected to each other as, as having that shared experience of being fans of the Sidemen watching their content every day or every week. I think some people really wanted more. And so, yes, you can have a Discord and and platforms like that, which we do. But for the boys, again, it needs to be big. It needs to be at a level which which provides enough value to the fans, really and truly. So that's why SciPlus came about. It's returnable and it's it's a format that works. So that was the starting point. It was SciCast BTS. We had giveaways. We had Ask the Sidemen. And then we also had the Eat and Greet, where we had fans come down and then actually eat with the guys who had size together, I think, in the first one. And we, we did one actually recently on the weekend. Um, so opportunities for closer connection, essentially. Um, and yeah, and then we expanded from that to a 1,000 square foot <laughs> studio pretty quickly. Obviously, Victor being in that position, he knew what it was like to set up from nothing. He was then able to really expand it, going from one small little 500 square foot, three, no, 200, 200 square foot or 300 square foot unit to 1,000 plus square foot with three sets. And now it's got three sets. It's got more side men on the corner where the where the boys film. It's got you know I think a, a two of the sets are transferable. Um, cameras everywhere. It's just all kitted up so they can walk in, show 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 show, leave, and wow, it wow. automates everything. So is there a head of Side Plus, and was that person put in place before you launched? Victor. It? Victor. So Victor okay, started okay. off as a head of Side Plus before then, it launched. Yes. Mm-hmm. So just we brought him in about we brought him in about five weeks before, and, <laughs> and he's facilitated like the growth and the decisions to move to the next studio and right. So he's like the MD. He was like the MD of Side Plus essentially. Director, yeah. So imagine. Yeah. So he was his role was to come in, make it happen, build it, grow it, and then expand it from there. And, and that was, and he did it amazingly well. And was he incentivized as well by the growth of Side Plus? Yeah. So on our side of things, so we okay. kind of brought him in as, as you know, on our side, um, as part of Arcade, essentially, as he still, he oh, still is, he's director of Arcade, because we wanted him to be part of that journey of building for them mm-hmm. rather than it being a slightly different relationship. And so he was fully aligned. He was then, you know, he left his job to come and do this coming on a decent salary but you know with the upside that actually this could be transformation if this yeah. really kicks on so he was aligned and again big principle for us is alignment like how do you really align people on for the long term when people are like like him and you're a small business and you need to start and this is a thing a thing for creators to really bear in mind like you have power to distribute equity and revenue shares and salary yeah. to use those levers mm-hmm. as tools to bring people on the journey so that they work 10 times harder 20 times harder 30 times harder for totally. you when people are super protective and they want to keep everything they don't go that far i think the people that really go far in this space and in the traditional space are the ones who are the most open to sharing. And I always say, if you're willing to do 50% of the work, you should have 50% of the business. <laughs> you shouldn't be saying, well, I need 95% or I need 100% and you're going to work on a salary for me, but I'm expecting you to do everything. And it's a, I mean, I, that just works personally for me, not for everybody. But I think that kind of a mindset of how do we align people long-term is really key. So Victor was part of that where he felt like, you know what, look, I'm going on this journey with this. This isn't just a salary job for me. Um, and I think that's that's did really important. Side plus work immediately. Like were, were fans flocking to pay because it, it's it's about ten dollars a month US, right? Six or seven pounds a month. Yeah. So that's like a Netflix subscription, mm. right? Like we, I'm paying double. Like I pay for Netflix. Now I pay for Side Plus. Yeah. Uh, like that's like the Side Men's mm. own version of Netflix. Yeah. And it has a ton of content on it. Yeah. Um, but were fans immediately receptive to that? Yeah. They were. Yeah, they were. And and we worked really hard. Like I think in the UK it's 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 a lot harder to get pricing right than in yeah. the US, right? Because smaller market, 
naturally more cynical as a culture towards yeah. commercialization, right. et cetera. Um, but we really wrestled with like, how do we provide so much value that no one can ever question the value of this? Got it. Took ages wrestling that price point, yeah. wrestling the amount of content. How do we, what content do we launch with? What content do we then follow up with? How do we provide enough? Because if you don't provide enough, then you'll immediately, people see through it. And people, I think people nowadays are very wise to this kind of stuff. They understand if something's value, if value fair or if it's not. Um, and that's why we stressed about it to a real degree so that we could provide maximum value for a good price for people. And I think we were able to get there in the end. So how significant is the revenue from Side Plus? Like where does it stack up now in the Sidemen world of, yeah. of obviously where they get their revenue from? Yeah, I mean, it's like, it's, it's, it's up there. It's up there like high up there now. And I think that's, yeah, it's allowed them more than anything to have a bigger studio, to hire more people. We hire a lot of people for Side Plus now, not a ton of people, but a good amount to, again, bake in as much value as we possibly can. So yes, these things make money, but actually the benefit of, of creating a, you know, a great engine like this, that's commercial and that provides value is that you can then bring that back in and then we can upgrade the studio we can have more producers we have a new head of side plus called joe who's incredible um who came over from foot asylum we have producer on the show we have runners we have a whole team around it now that wouldn't be possible unless you had that commercial how much viewership room. do the side men do on a monthly basis across all channels so it's about 244 million, 244 views million views. and that's on long form content yeah excluding the shorts content. exclude yeah. that no that's who shorts and excuse side plus okay so if we look at that, like typically I think a conversion to a membership is like, let's say 5% mm. for creators. Cause it's pretty sticky. Yeah. Even if the average is 10 million views a video, that's an insane amount of subscribers. I know you're not yeah, going to tell yeah, me yeah, how yeah, many yeah, members yeah. you have, that's right. but I'm thinking in my head at $10 a month mm. with the scale of audience they have, that has to be one of the highest margin products that. Well, the, that the great thing. Do. Yeah. I mean, I think for creators out there, digital products are just, they're just the one. Yeah. I mean, like for us, we're in a position where it's not just about that. It's about brand building. That's why sides is so good because you get the distribution, right? You're on every high street. That's a touch point that wouldn't yeah. be there. And when people think that sides makes a lot of money, I mean, I, like it makes money, but for the side men, like for anyone involved in the business, no, this is about building brand yeah. value. And anyone who knows the food business knows how hard the food business is. To Let make. alone with seven creators yeah. and three founders like you're splitting it so many different ways right 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 i'm curious about you talked about like one of your principles is getting mm. everyone aligned mm. with seven guys and three of you mm. you know how does how do they still remain you know aligned and and together mm. and um you know there's there's so many different dynamics there with the group like how how does it all work yeah. i guess well, I think they have the best system internally between them because they're seven real friends who've become, you know, b b have kind of fallen into working with each other in a really commercial way now, in a corporate way, right? They have a team around them. They have staff. They have a HR person. They have all sorts. I think they've built their processes and we've fallen into that really nicely because they've got their, their own house in order. And I think we were talking about this before. When creators work with management, they need to know management need to know the brief and you need to work your manager and manage your manager by giving them clarity around expectation, around your own structure, your own process, what you expect. And I think they were always very clear, like they work as the board. We basically report into that board as management, but they make the final call on everything. We are never there to say, do this, do that, go here, go here without them deciding and agreeing through the Supreme Court that it's a 4-3 it's a <laughs> majority at least, and then yes, they'll do it, but they all have to be aligned. And that's why I think actually working with seven people in a group like this is in a way easier than working with you know um, one client because actually one person might sometimes be more emotionally driven, they might mm. sometimes be more rational, they might sometimes have more going on in their personal lives that they can't share the load like the sidemen can. They can share the load with each other. So it means that there's almost a healthier detachment individually which allows for better outcomes because everyone's about what's best for the group and everyone's also about what the majority decides rather but than I would imagine individual. I would struggle as one of the sidemen watching KSI and his career trajectory even when I think about some of the opportunities he gets you know specifically with Prime mm. you know my, my question would be like is that not something you want to bring to the sidemen is that not something we could amplify even more as a collective and as mm. a group or 
why is that an opportunity for you and not an opportunity for us? And what is that dynamic? Yeah. You know, even, yeah, yeah, even for, for sure. you as, as, you know, a leader in the group, like mm. how do you deal with one specific member, you know, breaking out like that? Mm. Well, I think JJ is, you know, an incredible talent, like in so many different ways and an incredible person, probably one of the nicest people I've ever met. I think most people can testify to how humble and kind and generous he is to everybody. He's great in so many ways. And I think his success is a testament to all of the extra work that he's been able to put in, in the verticals that he has for a number of years, separately, alongside everything else. And I think it's hard for anyone to look at that and say that that isn't necessarily des deserved or that isn't warranted based on what he's put in. Um, I think it's a perfect outcome for that and he deserves all of that success. It's incredible to watch. And what's amazing for all of us is we get to learn from somebody now operating at a global level, especially through Prime, where the business has just gone through the roof as we know. And it's been unbelievable to watch that from when it first came out to now and to see how him and the team, his team over there, Mams and, and the rest of, rest of his crew have been able to, to sort of manage that uh, at such scale and to do it so like inspirationally, I think. I think it's incredibly inspirational. So I look at it fully and I can't speak for anybody else, but I personally look at it and see his success as being like a blueprint for how you can really hit mainstream in a different way in new sectors that we've never tried before. We're not in those worlds. We're not in sport. We're not in uh, hydration drinks per se. But the fact that he's led the way on those things, it's open doors for everything else that we're trying to do. It makes mm -hmm. conversations with franchise partners way yeah. easier mm -hmm. on sites. It makes conversations with retailers way easier on right. vodka. And actually, if it wasn't for that, we would be the ones leading the way in those conversations. But they've opened the door through the US and through that global scale of the business to conversations that we wouldn't be having. So I'm incredibly grateful. I can't speak for any of the guys, obviously, and for anyone else. But for me, I see it as a huge beacon of inspiration that helps us to achieve everything we want to do. Yeah, I mean, the bigger his profile gets, in a way, the better for the group, as long as the group is still together. It's only right. in the, the one directions of the world where Harry Styles and Zayn, they break up, where yeah, yeah, yeah. then it's like, all right, once it's broken up, they're, You're on, your own. they're yeah. on their own. Yeah. And yeah. exactly. And, and, you know, he was there in the studio yesterday. He does all of his commitments. He is very committed to the side men. He believes in it clearly and he loves it. Right. They all love being around each other and doing what they do. They enjoy nothing more. At the end of the day, we can do sides. We can do vocal. We can do anything. than making content. That's the bit that gets them out of bed is making fun videos and doing great things together. Um, I think it's a real yeah. testament that they're still together, like seven people. And it, maybe it does help that it's seven and not mm. three, because mm. three might be more likely to break up. Yeah. The, the pressures of like the seven person dynamic, if one person's upset or something, there's so many people to confide in and talk to. Yeah. Um, but it, obviously it does change their relationship. The longer mm. it goes, the more businesses you mm. launch. Um, Was it Ethan e who said yeah. we're more colleagues than friends? <laughs> yeah. Right. And people yeah, were kind of up in arms about it, that. He got, he, got, he got heat from that. He got a lot of I heat think from unnecessary. that. I think unnecessary. I get the point he was trying to make, which is that he, the, this friendship group has become a, basically a business relationship, principally because they see each other to do business. And it's not mutually exclusive. I don't think it means yeah. you can't be friends. Yeah, he was exaggerating I, the point. I heard that and I was like, yeah, I totally get that. Your mm. context together actually has been longer now as colleagues. Yeah. Working yeah. to build something than it is just friends hanging out. Yeah. And I that's mean, maybe we can, you know, make some headlines right now, but I consider us we, colleagues. Yeah, we are colleagues. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> we started as yeah. Yeah, colleagues. But, yeah. but it is a different relationship when you're working on something yeah, with yeah, someone. Yeah. I understood what he was saying. Yeah. Like yeah. It, it must change the relationship. Of yeah. course it does. Yeah. It doesn't mean you I don't enjoy be being harder around each other. if we started as friends. Yeah, I yeah, think it'd, it's it'd be more complicated. Our it's context complicated. is just like yeah. we yeah. enjoy spending time together working and building. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I think for them, it's they did start as friends, but have become, and this is what the point he was trying to get at, is they've become colleagues insofar as the business has become dominant in their lives and the relationship they have with yeah. each other is entirely within a business context because everything they do together is for their wider side men business. Right. Yeah. Which, I, which, is, which is the point. Although he got, he got grilled for it. I want to ask you. TikTok, but yeah. <laughs> I want to ask Lesson. you about when you know a business doesn't work. Because mm. I feel like you guys are one of those groups in the creator world, the side men, where it seems like they're always making headlines, mm. always launching. They're, we have side men ping pong in our office. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Tabletop we play ping pong. It. Yeah, it's we great. play it. Oh, it's great. It's fun. I also, great. you know, you hear about the side men hotel. Mm. How do you guys kind of evaluate? a new venture? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think we evaluate ventures based on, firstly, that spreadsheet. That's actually our first reference point. 
the do Supreme they believe Court. in it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so how, good. And actually, there's a number of ideas. There's like 15 things on there, right? That could all be doable. But do they really believe in it? Is number one. So did it rank highly? If it's a new idea, then you know, taking it to them and saying, guys, like, you know, do you believe in this? We think this could work. And there are some of those and some of the things that are coming. And then I think it's saying, right, is this a market or an, or an area that can be disrupted with, you know, the pairing of their distribution with the right partner? and the right expertise that can really help this take off. So I think it's it's bringing that alignment together. It's us saying, we're not doing this ever on our own. Like we're never here to try and run a hotel. We're never here to try and run a fried chicken. I have no idea how to run a fried chicken restaurant. I now have a little bit of insight, but it is hard and you need to be an expert in terms of doing that. We have Gordon, who's our head of food, formerly at m and and Costa. Ramsey, or- basically, he's, okay, just, yeah, basically. He's, no, he's yeah exceptionally talented cook. Um, Gordy McDermott, and he came from Costa Coffee and M&S and all these amazing businesses. We have Deck, who, you know, ran Ghost Kitchens for Deliveroo, literally. He's our, one of our chefs. Robin, who is our CEO, who has been pivotal to GDK. So you have experts around you. So I think without the partnership, it's not even a conversation. So the first step, I actually, I actually think, is bring the partner in. If we, you know, I'm out there, obviously, doing a lot of talks, meeting people, networking. You meet people and they go, wow, I've got this infrastructure. I've got this business. We could do something amazing together. And then you say, okay, cool. Does it tick with one of these things on, on our strategy? Is it part of our, our kind of vision, if you will, that we set out to do two years ago? And if it is, then actually, like hotels was and it is. Actually, is there a coming together for that? And then if there is, then you say, right, this is... This is this is a goer, and I think you have to pair that, of course, with the um, with the, with the audience. But I think my fundamental thing is most categories are ripe for disruption from the creator space. There's really, I think, an open field for anyone who can bring the distribution with a great brand, great marketing together, and, and a great product together. It's easier said than done, but I don't overly fear the territory so much or the sector. It's more our ability to make something that's amazing within it, even if it's entirely random or entirely right. seems entirely random, especially at the scale. Yeah, that you guys have. Yeah, right. Because that's different for other creators who are maybe more niche, like like us, right? Like we're not launching a hotel. Mm. Could we launch maybe an Airbnb that's like a creator retreat? Maybe it's good. That I think we we also have to be careful about how many things we launch. Mm. We only have so much bandwidth, and we only have so much messaging power from a brand perspective. Yeah. And when I look at the sidemen, I wonder how much messaging power, how much Mm. bandwidth do you actually have to launch a number of things? Like, do you think about that? Of Oh, we don't yeah. want to launch too many things or this is the right amount. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I don't know if this is shared by others. I can only speak for myself, but I almost look at the entrepreneurial journey as the entertainment. So I, th- mm. I see it as content, weirdly. So launching sides is content in itself. Launching vodka is content. Launching, doing the charity match, doing Christmas drillings or Christmas. That was all content. So I almost see it as principally from a marketing perspective about the entertainment side of things. Like how do you make the brands fun? How do you make them, you know, have their own identities have their own personality their tone of voice but how do you make it another engine of content that can live in its own world because if you can make it entertaining and you can make it fun and engaging and you build a community around it then i think as long as the product is great people don't mind i think people aren't looking and saying oh they've done too much as long as they're making amazing things that are value adding and are working at a great level if the products suck and you're charging money for them, people will hate you forever right. and you'll lose the respect. Respect comes from integrity and you have integrity by making a great product and by trying to provide value to fans without ripping them off, ultimately. So and that's the balance that's hard to strike. How protected are you though from YouTube as a platform mm. when easily you could think, okay, these are businesses built off the back of YouTube yeah, and anything can happen to YouTube, especially when it comes to viewership. Mm. Is that a yeah. concern for you guys? JJ said on one of the podcasts, and he said it repeatedly, if the main channel goes, then everything else loses its relevance. I'm not sure if I believe that to its entirety, but I think the, the root of what he's getting at is there, which is that they all see themselves as YouTubers, principally. So YouTube is still very important, like more important than anything else. Everything else is just added value on top. It's icing on the cake. If the content operation isn't working at its best, if they are not excited about the content they're making, if they're not happy in filming great videos, then everything else will naturally take some kind of a hit. However, where I slightly differ on viewpoint with that is if we're building seeds and we're creating distribution at scale because of the affinity to the brand that is generational, they've connected for 10 years. And if we get that right, 
then they're protected essentially because you don't know what's going to happen to YouTube. No one knows. And there's side um, plus. And there's side plus. And that's why side plus is so. And this is also from from a management perspective. The big focus for us was building them the insurance plan that if YouTube falls. They have other revenue streams. They have other touch points to their audience. Not the YouTube before, it's the biggest one, the biggest companies in the world. But you never know what will happen. And actually having your whole life in the hands of another company is tricky. And every creator pretty much is dependent on YouTube's success. So they also just launched a retail store, physical retail store. It feels like one of the core themes is like physical mm. stuff, right? Of course, you have the yeah. foundation of digital, Side yeah. Plus and the channels, the advertising business. Yeah. but. The, you know, the charity match, I think you posted that it was an hour and a half and 62,000 tickets sold. Yeah, it, it would have been instant if they could have sold. If if the ticketing process, processing, sorry, at Ticketmaster was quick enough, it would have been instant. We That's amazing six, that yeah. Ticketmaster can't keep up with, with that. But no, 62,000 yeah. tickets mm. sold is absolutely insane. And then seeing the imagery this past weekend... 6,000 people are standing outside of a retail store to buy side yeah. merchandise. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's different. As I said, it's the same thing. You walk out on the pitch, you look around. It's that same connection, just in different ways, forms, touch points. The store for Simon Clothing is unreal. Like Matt, who's the CEO, who's the MD, sorry, of, of Simon Clothing, is exceptional. He's been, he's been there since they were, he was packing um, t-shirts for them in their sidemen house he went to school i think with josh they've known each other for years right he was literally started there and now he's running this probably one of the biggest merch operations in well definitely the biggest in the country one of the biggest i'm sure in the world um and he's done an incredible job and, and blue water which is a shopping center in kent it's it's a very kind of young area there's lots of families quite residential and to launch there is like such a statement. They all used to go there, some of them, where they're That's like cool. Matt mm. and um, Josh, they used to go there after school. They always said like Blue Water is like a real thing for us. It's, it's their shopping center that they went to when they were kids. And to see their own store there is unreal. And I mean, the launch and what that I think has done already for credibility, I think nothing makes the digital real more than physical experiences or, for, or the physical manifestation of the audience. It makes people wake up and go, wow, like you had 6,000 people at a shopping center through the on saturday that is obscene in terms of numbers no one no other retailer will be able to do those kind of numbers like it's just not happening the amount of traffic that they brought to the shopper center the amount of um people queuing up before i think it was 1500 people in the queue at nine o'clock in the morning it's just like crazy i think people at seven o'clock were, were queuing outside like that is again different and it's a different league digital yeah. is fantastic but the physical is where you get a different level and i think shops for Simon Clothing, stores for sides, things like a hotel, they will all help to do that. Let's talk about the organization. Yeah. You, you've talked a couple times about team, you know, and like that there's 30 plus people who work with the sidemen. What what does the organization look like? Because it seems like with every project you've mentioned a managing director of that project. And then I imagine like there's other infrastructure there. Like at this scale, what does the sidemen team yeah. look like? So we have, it's, I would almost split it into commercial and content. And then I'd say Victor pivots the two. So on content, you would have Cyplus and Cyberman Entertainment. And Cyplus and Cyberman Entertainment have a lot of people, probably the most bodies. Cyberman Entertainment, as you'd imagine, that's all the channels, let's call it that, um, has tons, as you'd imagine, video editors, producers, cameramen, photographers, social managers, shorts editors, etc. They all sort of sit within Simon Entertainment. You then got Side Plus that has a sort of similar reflection of that, but on a smaller level, obviously you don't need the same scale because the volume's not as high, but you have Joe, who's sort of head of that platform, now head of creative and sort of driving that. You have Kelvin, who's a producer. You have a number of other people around that who support on the shoots and ideation, creativity, etc. You've also got Joe Gilmore now who came in from Lab Bible, who's incredible. He's senior creative strategist. He's sort of augmenting the strategy across both of those strands in content, but also some of the commercial sort of sits, a bit, I guess, in the middle. And then you have the commercial team. So, or I guess, commercial brand special projects. So within that team, you have, I'd say, charity matches, one project. You have side cards, trading cards with tops, which is another project that we've now sort of taken in-house in terms of all the design, all of the creativity. That's all done by us now. Um, you have XX Vodka. You have Sides. Um, and then you have, I'd say, special projects, which are things like Christmas drillings or some of the other stuff that we can't talk about this in development. So maybe new projects um, would sit there. So that's kind of the spread. You have, yeah, those sort of five lanes and then you have a split and then you have Simon Entertainment and Side Plus. And that's kind of, and then you have, you know, 
the more corporate side, i.e. HR, like we've got an amazing head of people who's called Chantel. She's great. Looks after the office, looks after everybody in the team. Um, I'm trying to think what else we have. I think that's pretty much the spread. So but as then, I yeah. hear this, I'm curious, why is Arcade separate? Why are you not in-house as like the CEO of the Sidemen? Yeah, that's good. I think it's a good question i think because we always <laughs> set it up like we just set it up like that because yeah. it was the lowest risk way of doing it where we have me aaron there. and sam have our company that makes sense the simon have their company it just keeps everything nice and distinct i think it also would create challenges in terms of in terms of the splits and the dividends and that sort of stuff. it's very clean having our own entity That's true. and i think the way i'd almost see it is yes everyone what we we are the external brand of the business side for the sidemen arcade but in reality we're building this whole team for them like this is their resource and capital that's going into this team. It's not like yeah. we're building our company for them. We're building their company. I we're, see. And we are basically three CEOs or maybe a you know, CFO, CCO, and a, C, a chief commercial officer, let's say, of the Sidemen world. They're the board. If you see it, that, that's kind of the easiest way of saying it. You see like board up here, seven Sidemen, Arcade, me, Aaron, and Sam. Sam would be CFO, Aaron would be Chief Commercial Officer, I'd be Chief Creative Officer, let's say. And then you have Victor, who's the MD of the Sidemen operation, if you will, across both brands and entertainment. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So all those people are employed by the Sidemen, not employed by our Exactly. Yeah, got it. Wow. That's really interesting. You you just kind of painted the picture of like a modern media landscape. Mm -hmm. Like we've worked worked with so many individuals so many create creatives creators nothing has come close to the efficiency the scale the creativity and the dynamism of these guys i also wonder what the reality is of there being another sideman coming and what competition looks like like if you actually even were looking for other opportunities yeah it's a great question i mean my belief is that no and or not in the way that we maybe see it now so we were talking about this, right? My personal take on the way that the space is is uh, growing. TikTok has come in and and created a divide in time where there was like pre-COVID, pre-TikTok creators. And I don't know, I might be wrong on this, but pre-COVID, pre-TikTok, um, pre-TikTok creators and then post-COVID, post-TikTok mm-hmm. creators or the TikTok era. And what that's done from my observation is it's drastically devalued content and creators because everyone's a creator now. Everyone can get reach. Everyone can get, I mean, the amount of people I speak to on Unboxed, my podcast about this stuff, where I'll speak to these TikTokers and they're like, yeah, lockdown was big and I blew up and it was great. And there, there are so many stories where they're able to get huge scale very quickly and brands are becoming creators. Now look at Ryanair, look at Duolingo, the amount of scale that these companies and individuals can, can find on these platforms of short form. And every day there seems to be someone new who's popping and they're not. And this, the up and down is so much quicker. The depth of connection is low as I think it's ever been. I don't think there's connection there between most creators and an audience anymore. I also don't think there are fans anymore. My personal sense is actually that because of TikTok and the way that that's changed consumption and the consumption of celebrity, it's just pure, like, you know, nonstop feed of information and content. I don't think people really care anymore about the individual per se. It's more the content, the video. What's the next video? What's the next video? Not who's this person? What do they provide? What's their value? And I think for me... That has completely changed everything to the point where there are no fans. Like, who has come through TikTok and really built a fan base? Who has come through in this last era now, this current era, and really built fans who would chase them down the street, who would be going yeah. to their merch store? Who could even launch a merch store? Who could even launch anything? I mean, there was that first crop that I would say, you know, the, the Charlie D'Amelio's, the the little hotties, like, and that's my assumption. Yeah. I actually don't know how. But, he, but that's the peak. That's the peak. Yeah. And what? And nice. Without with with all due respect to them. Compare that to the level of the last era and the level that we were able to obtain, what you guys are able to obtain, what Mr. Beast have been able to obtain, what some of the creators who've been building for that long on YouTube especially have been able to do beyond their platform in terms of connection and depth, who people have genuine fans. Yes, they may have had celebrity, but even the biggest of the biggest of the biggest, I don't think carry with them the depth of connection. And that's the job. It's like, how can they pivot? And I'm sure some of them will be doing that, but pivot into connection emma chamberlain is a great example right of somebody who's kind of crossed both but she's built a huge amount of connection she's got genuine fans i feel like there's almost that era and then the next one which i don't know where it will go it's my personal sense do i think that the do i think the fan connection is enough to build what we've built with the cyber and what the cyber have built on their own can you fill a stadium yeah no i think it just may take time we may be in a gap of age where there are a lot of creators who took to tiktok Mm. 
and are maybe working to get over to YouTube, but haven't fully. And then there are some young creators who are on YouTube, but it will take another five, perhaps even 10 years Possibly, for them to yeah. get to a point where they do have audiences that have been with them for 10 years. I think about yeah. Dude Perfect, right? Mm. Dude Perfect just went on a tour and mm. packed every stop of the tour. They've been in the market for how long, right? That's one of the most established entertainment brands. And I think maybe we forget sometimes because there has been such a rapid pace of like, mm. whoa, that person mm. shot up to 10 million subscribers or you know, a million views. And short form content created a warped view of how much value we put on views and subscribers, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Because yeah. if you can't fill a room with mm, people, what's the point? What, yeah, it's not, then it's not mm. as sticky, right? Mm. And so I think that time and market and trust, credibility of these brands we as creators are going to have to do things differently. Like we're thinking about a tour next year, right? Yeah. Can we can we do physical events? Mm. You know, and I think that'll be a big marker of what our business looks like yeah, yeah. and what our community looks like. Have we actually built a dedicated community? And we have ways of of knowing that answer. Yeah. Um, and I'm very confident in that. But that's the thing that we're working on is and we know we're still a young brand too. Yeah, the I feel that's not as young. A lot of our peers and some of our friends. Yeah. You look at Michelle Carre, mm. Eric, Jesser. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesser in the conversation of sports YouTube with yeah. Dude Perfect taking off right now. But it may be five, ten more years mm. in the market but, uh, where yeah, we look yeah. at some of these creators and we're like, oh, that is the Dude Perfect of yeah, today. Yeah. yeah, I think I think that's that's a good. I think it might. I think it's as you guys have said and we talked about this before. It's it's more about localized communities, like more precise value adding. Right. to audiences big scale entertainment doesn't really drive connection anymore because there's so many people doing it but what will is actually like max fosh as we said who's yeah. amazing you know doing a sellout run at edinburgh festival which is a comedy festival in the uk yeah. selling out the palladium doing a comedy special building out a vertical for himself in comedy that drives connection because comedy drives immense connection for people in a way that is different same way I would say with it, with a number of creators who are, you know, Ali Abdel is another good example. Somebody who's built a really dedicated community around his ability to provide value on productivity. His yeah. courses, huge, great. They're not, they're not massive, 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 but they're very dedicated. So for me, it's more about what would you rather have? Huge, huge, huge numbers or people who really care? Would you rather pack out, you know, a hundred people in a, in a, in a venue, but have a hundred thousand subs? Or would you rather have a million subs, but not be able to get anyone there? But and the I, know what I, would I think the incentive structures for young creators are really confusing right mm. now, right? Because it's like viewership, subscribers does equate to brand deals and AdSense revenue, right? Mm. And so the the chase is after that feeling of uh, okay, I'm, I'm the numbers are going up, yeah. And sometimes you completely miss that you're not building any depth with an mm. audience. Mm. And you're chasing the the high numbers because again the, the the industry is set up to reward that in yeah. the advertising context, right? Mm. Um, I wonder what you think. Like I know you've you've talked quite a bit about the creator middle class, yeah, and this kind of promise of the creator middle class and it mm. being non-existent. What's your perspective? Yeah. on on the gap between the side men and you know Mr. Beast and yeah, yeah. Logan and like the rest mm. of of the creator economy. I did a talk on this three days ago actually and the whole thing was how can brands understand and better navigate this new time we're in where you have the top 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 who i call creator inc who because of their ability to make a good amount of money over a long period of time have enough cash to invest in themselves and their businesses to go to that next level so like mr beast i think said on your show right like no one's going to catch up you cannot catch up with what he's doing the levels he's spending the returns of that investment it's a fulfilling cycle right it goes up and up and up and for me i look at the space right now and i see creator inc like what we're doing the sidemen they've built an amazing business over 10 years they can then invest that in people to come in and then scale these businesses and work with partners and they're at a level which allows for them to go to that that next tier but how many people are able to make that jump it's almost like now because the ability to make money is I would say a lot lower than it is. And in the UK, especially brand deals are really tough. Like brands are now spending a lot more from what I'm seeing with what I would call the creator working class, not the middle class. They're spending more, more of their budget dispersed amongst a larger pool of creators. There are many companies that are influencer agencies, even some tech that are helping brands to deploy to a thousand TikTok creators, let's say. That's the biggest chunk of their budget. And they look at that and they go, well, look, we actually went viral three times from 
20 creators we got 10 million views on that video maybe a thousand on this one but look this one it's got half a million it's like buying stocks and then they go hold on you're asking me to pay 50k for a video on youtube which might get 100,000 views 200,000 views half a million views whatever it might be or 20k or 10k for a video and i think brands look at that and they go that doesn't make sense anymore they care about reach awareness rarely do they care i think or not care but i think they care less and less actually about attachment and alignment in the influencer space i think they're more about how do we just get as much number as many numbers as we can so then we look at the future and say well if you're a creator who is used to making a certain amount of money you have to chase the adsense then which is why you then are incentivized to as you say build content that fits the algorithm that hacks youtube but that doesn't drive connection is my theory i don't yeah. think that drives connection but then how do you monetize and like in an early stage as a creator Bro, in the world. I think it's hard. I think it's really hard. And this is the bit. And this is why my skepticism around the creator economy starts to kick in a little bit. And I go, this is really difficult. How, if you're a new creator and you start off, let's say on TikTok or on YouTube and you're trying to get your way, how do you make this a commercially viable business for yourself? It's really difficult. And I think you're going to see a lot more, a lot more creators out there have other jobs working alongside their content as I think they already are because TikTok, especially, which is where the incentivization for awareness is there but it makes no money. So I think a lot of people are doing both. YouTube is a, is a time drain more than ever, I think for people it seems because the need to compete requires resource, requires time to make stuff of that level, which will cut through. So then where do people go? And that's where I, I see the kind of creator middle class shrinking, the creator working class widening, and then the creator ink being right at the top, almost untouchable. And that's why I, I struggle to see another side bent. I might be completely wrong and please anyone feel free to tell me I'm being I, dumb, but that's my I instinct. don't think you're wrong. I've, I've had a similar perspective on like the larger kind of creator class, mm. primarily because the sheer quantity of creators that will accept a $500 or $1,000 brand deal. That yeah. is, that's creating a more dispersed- hundred dollars. Right. It's, it's creating more of a dispersed <laughs> yeah. view of the world, mm -hmm. right? Of uh, like that is that is a challenge for how our advertising business works, mm. which means the creators who are going to turn into that creator ink are the ones who have already pre-established a depth of connection where they can launch the other yeah from the revenue streams exactly. So it is a very different era. Um, mm. I think we're going to see really unique styles of deals, and I also think I agree with you that the in-house creatives might change yeah the agency business might pick back up of like yeah. ad agencies yeah oh yeah that that 100%. employ young people who mm. know how to make good creative at lower prices mm. volume deals right? yes yeah. yeah i do think though it is absolutely in the best interest of the platforms of mm. youtube of tiktok of instagram to make sure that new creators can find depth of connection and turn it into a sustainable business yeah right i agree we like they if youtube wants to be youtube in 20 years, which I know it does, in 40 years. Mm. Like we're gonna be 40 and 50 and 60. Like they truly will need young creators who are able to find depth of connection. So whether it's possible right now or not, yeah. which that may be true mm. because of short form platforms, mm. no matter what, there is gonna have to be some way. Yeah, well, I think mean, the pendulum swings, right? And yeah. now it's swinging in favor of short form. It's swinging in the favor of high censorship, people not having as much of a voice optimization strategy you know all of that side of things very important but it seems to dominate the conversation more than the expression mm. really and i think it's we're going to see a time where maybe it swings back and actually it changes again or there's a new platform or a new iteration or something comes that disrupts i think it's really hard i think for creators out there who are starting it's it's honestly very difficult i think when you have though some connection when you find a pocket of value maybe it's just not thinking so big you don't need to be creator ink let the coca-colas of the world right. be the coca-colas mm -hmm. you can be an amazing independent brand that has a strong depth of connection with a small group like ali abdel's a great example he's a great example mm -hmm. he's making he published you know, he made a million pounds on his last course like that's obscene that's amazing yeah. and you know he's got a small team he's got great infrastructure he's created a depth of connection and value and he's making great money off of it for him to invest yeah. in other things and for himself personally a great lifestyle business. amazing yeah. lifestyle but yeah. i think that's the future of this mm. it's not mr beast it's is, not the side bend. is yeah. there some insight because i feel like uh, the past couple of years have been dominated by short form conversation or short form yeah. content us mm. having a conversation around shorts 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 tiktok yep. tiktok tiktok short form con content mm. now us as well as sidemen mm. and a few other brands have pushed into extremely long form content our episodes are pushing into the hour and a half, two yeah. hour range. Yep, and yep. our watch time is going up 
Mm. People are watching this long of content. Sidemen Sunday, you know, two two plus hours is wild on YouTube. In yeah. a world where short form yeah, content yeah. is what everyone's talking about, my perspective is that long form content is the test of depth. 100%. And it's the way to build depth. 100%. The challenge is just because you're just because you have a voice on short form and just because oh, you yeah, have relevance be. there as we know because we see you see it everyone sees the conversion is n none. There are very few I don't can't think of any. There must be some out there. Please like some like, if there's anybody in the comments or whatever who can tell me some who've successfully converted from TikTok to YouTube because I don't really know of any really who've done it yeah. well, done it at a great level and maybe that's because of everything I've been saying around the, the lack of fans. Do they really have fans who travel with them? I think right. a lot of people I see on TikTok, they might have a million followers, two million followers. They try on YouTube and they're getting 5K subs, 2K subs, 1K subs. They're literally, there's hardly any crossover at all. And it's probably a weird emotional feeling of I have a couple million over here <laughs> yeah. and YouTube's a really long journey. Mm. You start a YouTube channel, that's a long journey. That's not yeah. like an overnight thing. So, no. And you can't get there through. I think right. the, the big thing is you have to build that independently, right? And that's the thing of speaking to all these creators on Unbox. You see the thread. You have to stick at it for a long period of time before it works, whoever you are, because you need to find your own unique like play in the space you're in a unique voice your perfect value proposition and that takes time marginal mm -hmm. gains 10% of video to get there as you guys know right you're saying doing this for five like yeah. five six years as a as, as a duo with the, with the podcast and everything else and it took you a long time to get that voice yeah. perfectly right and once it clicks that's it but I think a lot of these creators have started in the last two years on TikTok think oh well I've got numbers on TikTok it'll immediately convert and no you have to build an entirely new audience over here entirely new no one will come over with you and that might take four or five years but if your voice is proven on TikTok how do you translate that voice to YouTube without thinking that the audience will come with it and I think the people that a lot of creators I think don't necessarily want to put in the time to build those platforms because it is a long long journey and fair enough you sit in there with a million followers you think 10 percent of them will come over when 0.1 percent do how does that make you feel right what's your advice for creators to become commercially viable the first is you have to be able to do zero to one by yourself i believe you shouldn't be taking on management until you are at a scale to warrant an management. established brand yeah. you shouldn't be you know signing anything exclusively you should be focused on building your voice building your connection focus on connection because without connection there's nothing to monetize, not to say you, you're monetizing your fan base, but there's nothing to commercialize there. There's no value exchange if there's no one to provide value for. Viewers does not translate into va into fans. Viewers does not translate into customers. And you need to build a clear value proposition first and foremost and a voice that is strong. And you need to make sure that that is your priority until and until that works on your own, then you can seek external support and a team, I think. I think a lot of creators jump the gun on that. You won't be able to afford it principally and that's a lot harder than it was because you're gonna to have to do more jobs wear more hats on your own but i think once that starts to work i think dodford's a good example of that in a very different way where he was doing everything by himself he has a couple of videos that bang he's been doing it for a long time he was on tiktok he then pivoted to youtube started fresh managed to find a formula that worked for him and then by video two video three or you know in the sidemen video really actually ironically took everything off for him and then he's got a commercial business he's making money from his archive he's making money from his future content because he's grinded on his own for mm. so long he didn't have a management he didn't have a team i don't believe i might be wrong i don't think he did he did it by himself and that's the key you have to really grind these things out independently get to a scale where they're making some money and then invest that money in a team to help you go to the next level step by step not looking too far ahead and i think if you can do that which is possible today you have to do that on your own then it's a case of right what's step two what's step three how do i get a team how do i get a great accountant how do i get people around me to support me to go from step two to step three to step four um but if you're trying to jump the gun go straight into brand deals or to try and procuring brand deals go straight into you know trying to launch things without having the connection and without proving that connection then i think it's going to fall down so i don't know if that makes sense but that's yeah. mm -hmm my sense what's your advice to us as we mm. embark on this journey if you look at us from the outside looking in yeah like where do you think our opportunities are it's a good question I, so i think you guys are like the best of like I, i'm not, not saying it's because i think you are unbelievable what you do and i've always looked at you guys as being the gold standard for the industry for news about the for everything to do with the creator economy as we said on unboxed like you know 
it's a lacrosse equivalent. You mm. guys nailed your niche. You've nailed this next niche. It is a niche. And that's the other thing. Creator economy is and more of a niche than I thought it was actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It is a niche. Bigger in the States, but still a niche. And you you own that space to such a degree that it's just unbelievable. I think for you guys, it's about how do you support creators, but also to the point we're talking about, about entrepreneurship more broadly. What does it mean to be a YouTube creator in 2023? It's not just about producing entertainment. It's a lot about business actually. And actually people making money online in whatever field that might be. So I think it's about how do you guys become the voice of digital entrepreneurship as well as content creators because content creators are digital entrepreneurs. How does that broaden out from, from as you did with Tim Ferriss? I thought that was a great example. Yeah. Someone like Tim is a really great move away from content creators exclusively into thought leadership, into wider, bigger, purposeful conversation around you know, some of the big issues which impact the modern entrepreneur. I think you guys do that amazingly well. And that for me, that sort of move is like, yeah, that's, that's great. And then it's about physical connection, live live experiences, courses, you know, you building out products and IP around the value that you're giving and also the people that you're able to speak to. I also do think, you know, I looked at like what Masterclass obviously did and in that time, is there like a better version of that that's more suited Mm. for not just creators, but for digital entrepreneurs, for people Mm. who make money on the internet. That's cool. Which is really what this is all about. Totally. You know? And then it's, I think it also oh, gone. No, I was going to say it's a good perspective. I think like, I appreciate that by the mm. way. Uh, and I think like we really look at you, it, Tim Ferriss is a great example of like widening the view, not necessarily pivoting, but yeah. like mm-hmm. widening the view of what does uh, digital entrepreneurship look like? Yeah. What does a creator mean? Mm. Um, and then when you talk about masterclass and think about some of that, it's like, I think all of that is mm-hmm. access driven mm-hmm. and it still feels like to me, we're in the early stages, the infancy of building our trust with the people that we're engaging with yeah you know the other, I think, thing yeah. Well, the other thing i also think you guys would do amazing at is a book mm. that's something we've that's something we yeah. want and the reason yeah, yeah. books we don't make it. money no. really but they drive so much credibility like you guys being the educators on a global level at you know places like a davos or like a el what's it called dld festival or any of those big kind of mm. industry conferences are you being the voice of of this scene and establishing to the world how powerful this scene is, I think would be tra- like that kind of a piece would be just transformation. I think would really elevate and broaden outside of YouTube. Once you have that kind of a touch point, once you're a New York Times bestseller, which you would get immediately, it's like okay, cool, you're in a different level of thought right. leadership now. We, w- uh, we you make that sound very yeah. simple. Simple. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. We're very <laughs> overwhelmed by the premise of writing a book. I think yeah. we we have aspirations to do it, yeah. and uh, you can get help to do that as well. Yeah, right? but yeah. I think we also know that we'd ha- we want to take a significant break from mm. YouTube to do it mm. because we want to go all in, do it properly. Yeah, yeah, we want to like. It, we, there's no world where that's like a side project, right? That's no. like an all in effort. If you want to do it to your level, which is and everything that you guys do, and obviously spending today with you, like getting a glimpse of how you really care about your product and about what you're doing so it would need that level of detail and perfection but if you took a break and you said right we've got this much content banked we're going to take three months six months we're going to have a have a ghost writer to help you probably it helps to have somebody there who sure. copywriters. and you say right how do we make this the best book in the world and like yeah. really do something that puts this market and this economy this economy this industry of digital entrepreneurship, which I think is what it really is, right? Self-starters online, whether they're filmmakers or people like an Ali or whoever it might be. How do you bring that out to the, a much wider global audience, which you'd be able to do from the States, especially because you're in the country that is the leader yeah. in everything. Okay. All right. You yeah. just, yeah. Yeah. You kicked off an idea. You need there. any help? Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah maybe. <laughs> well, you're not taking on any other clients. Well, so. we're not. No. Yeah. 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 No, but <laughs> so just have, be friendly. I, yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> just a few friends hanging out. That's cool. Um, I, I have to ask you, I, I wrote this down. I forgot to ask it earlier. Like, what have you learned about dealing with controversy mm. with creators? Because that is something that as you reach larger and larger scale, yeah. you know, we always talk, we talked about this with Jimmy. We've talked about it internally. Mm-hmm. Like you go from this feeling of being underrated, right? Where you're like, oh, all your fans are like, I w- these guys are underrated. More mm-hmm. people should know about them. To like when you're as mainstream as a Mr. Beast or a Sideman, mm. people are after you. Right. And then not only that, everything you say is scrutinized. And then sometimes people are human and they say things that get them into trouble. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think the key to managing crises for any creator or any talent, personality, brand, whatever it might be, is to take accountability and realize that you can't hide anymore and you have to own up to your mistakes fully and be really open with that. 
be simple be clear um and don't overcook it don't overdo it just own up to if you made a mistake people are human and i think what's beautiful about this space is that the respect for the humanity of the artist creator whatever name you want to say is so much higher than in the traditional world where people were put on a pedestal and they had no flaws, flaws and faults. And you're still seeing that today. A lot of a lot of presenters in the UK have big falls from grace because they're seen as these shining cultural superstars who are untouchable and they're almost deified in the way that the culture looks to them. Whereas for creators, I think there's a humanity that drives that connection. You know these people are real. The reason why you like them is because they could be your friend. Therefore, they will make mistakes. Therefore, they will mess up. Therefore, they will need to apologize. And you hold them to account as an audience tightly. On the other, on the other hand, you know, the creator will accept that and will own that because that's what's made them as popular and successful as they are. So I think those principles still apply, but in the creator space, it's a lot easier, I would say, to hold your hands up in a way that traditional talent just can't do, um, which I think is liberating because if you do hold your hand up and you don't try to run away from it, your audience will respect that. And I think they'll support you in whatever it is. I think we've seen probably, uh, I mean, a lot of examples um, yeah. like that, if that makes sense. My last question for you is, is there a future for this term, the creator economy? Yes, but not how we think it maybe is. I, I do believe for sure, it's not even a question. The money that's made online is huge. The opportunity for, for young people to make businesses online has never been bigger before. For brands to grow online, never been bigger before. The opportunity for social to transform lives, huge. Do I think that the content creator economy or the content creator opportunities as big as maybe it's seen or maybe it felt a year ago two years ago five years ago no because i think this disruption has drastically shifted the market what i do think though on the other hand is that the opportunity for everybody to have a voice now has never been bigger social has never been more exciting because you can out of nowhere blow up you can go viral you can make a brand a huge success overnight that can happen today it couldn't happen before so for everyday people unbelievable for focused professional creators i think quite hard and that means people need to realign i think creators especially need to realign slightly in in light of this space what you do your value you provide the connection you're building those things tiktok or not will still be an opportunity to grow that and develop that and deepen that but how you build that business around that needs to change and that's where i think actually you know, as creators go into this new phase, it's having the awareness that there is a change taking place and not being stuck yeah. in 2016. Mm -hmm. Because if you're stuck in 2016, I think you're going to struggle commercially to build something. Your phone is blowing up. I imagine yeah, that you have uh, you have a lot of uh, business to get to. It's no, your wife, yeah. which is another yeah, part yeah, of yeah. you yeah. know big two part kid, of your life. Two kids, I think, are <laughs> probably crying in the car. So that's it. Yeah, I can imagine your day to day is pretty wild. Yeah, right. it's got a third on the way as well coming wow, in wow, like, in December. Thank you. Wow, I really so, yeah, appreciate you spending this much time yeah. with us. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's been a lot of fun. So thank you so much, guys, for for having me. Last, last question. Can Go we on. have passes to the charity match? Of course you can. Okay. Wow. Well, yeah. You have to. Oh, you hold, hold you to that. You've got to come. I think we have to come back uh, now we're in coming. September. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll see you back here in London Amazing. then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, <laughs> thank you guys.